Welcome everyone joining in person and online. Yeah, I'd love to have the house lights on so I can see you all. Uh, we're so excited that you're here. By the way, my name is uh, Steve and I'm the lead pastor here at Lifeway Church. Thank you so much. Um, God is good, and we are so glad to be in the house of the Lord. And each week what we've been doing is discovering the promises that we find within the Christmas story. And these promises actually align with the, the four themes of Advent, which are hope, peace, joy, and love. And then we're going to light the last candle, uh, Christmas Eve, with the Christ candle. And we're looking forward to that. Uh, just to kind of review where we've been through this series, we started off, do you guys remember week one, who we were talking about? Simeon. Simeon. Yeah, I, I call him Simon sometimes too, okay? Uh, yeah, Simeon, who despite many, many years, they think he was 112 years old, he's waiting for the Messiah, and then he sees his hope fulfilled through Jesus coming into the temple as a little baby, which is so beautiful. And then the second week, we looked at the promise of peace that was given to lowly shepherds, which signaled that, that the Prince of Peace was coming to set up a new kingdom and a kingdom that was for everyone, everywhere, no matter their walk of life. And then last week, we looked at the story of Zechariah and how we discovered how, how Christ, the joy that comes from Christ, is not just a feeling to experience, but it's a foundation we can build on. Today, we're going to share the promise of love through Mary's story. It's one of my favorite stories uh, to preach on. And by the way, if you missed any of those messages, you can go out to lifewaych.com and you can uh, watch those uh, at your leisure. Now, one of my favorite decorations is the nativity set. Um, uh, when, I was, uh, when we were just married, Tina and I actually got a beautiful one from one of our close friends. It had these intricate ceramic figurines uh, complete with accessories. I like accessories. It had clay pots and like real hay. Um, and it was so cool. But in the 24 years that I've been married, I've only gotten to set this thing up once. Okay. Why? Because while I love nativity sets, my wife loves cats. Okay. And cats love to play hockey like this and knock the figurines off of the table onto the floor. And then when they're done with that, they proceed to walk through this peaceful scene as if it was downtown Tokyo in a monster movie. Okay? <laughs> Catzilla versus Christmas. So I have become convinced over the years that cats are atheists. <laughs> or at least ours are. <laughs> And I make no friends here. But, um, and so to combat the bad influence of my cats, when our boys were small, I bought a Fisher-Price li Little Pony nativity set. Or not Little Pony, Little People. Okay? Anybody ever seen those things? They're super cute, right? They're not only cute, they're biblically accurate, and they're virtually indestructible. Okay? From either the unpredictable hands of small boys or the evil paw of our furry friends. The boys are grown now, so we gave it away, uh, but we this year adopted, many of you know, a, Shiba, uh, a Japanese dog, Shiba Inu Rescue, and uh, I have been thinking about ordering a new one of these, okay, one of these Fisher-Price sets to avoid another monster movie reenactment in our house uh, with this dog. Now, how many of you have had a nativity set in your home? Yeah, most of us have either had one or have one now. So I share about nativities because I think it's a very familiar thing. It's actually a familiar reminder of love coming into our world. The word nativity comes from the Latin, which means birth. And the nativity set that we bring out every year is a depiction of the birth of the God of the universe into our world. Surrounded by who? His, his mother? His earthly father, the barnyard animals, the, the shepherds, the angels, all the eyes of the nativity are fixed on who? Jesus, right? And that's what the nativity depicts for us because it's all about his birth, right? I think we can all identify with the significance of a baby's birth, right? Birth is, a baby's birth is a big deal. All right. In fact, we have this relatively new phenomenon that's taking over young couples who become pregnant. Do you know what it is? And people didn't get it in first service either. Okay, it's, it's, it's a gender reveal. All right? That's something that wasn't a thing. When, when our kids, when we had our kids back in the olden days, you know, when the, when the, uh, you know, the rainbow was in black and white, we, we didn't have those. Okay, And I just read that some gender reveals, actually people spend up to $10,000 on a gender reveal. 
Now, that might be a bit extreme, but I think we all can agree that the birth of a baby is a big deal, right? We all agree? Why? Because a baby is a symbol of life. They're a symbol of potential, right? And they're a symbol of love, a symbol of love between the parents. And 2,000 years ago, God was on the move to deposit the promise of love through the baby Jesus. You see, real love, true love, it requires action, God's action plan was set in motion thousands of years before the birth. In fact, there's a promise in the Old Testament that points right to our familiar nativity scene. It's found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You can follow up on your worship guide, uh, on your worship guide, which is down here, which is not up here, um, or the screen or in your Bible, Isaiah chapter uh, 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth uh, and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. The sign given to God's people is that they had not been forgotten. They had not been forgotten in their sinful and broken states. Rather, it was when they saw the virgin giving birth, that's how they would see love coming into the world and a rescue plan for all those who trust in him. In Luke chapter 1, it uh, captures a bit of the backstory of the nativity uh, scene, and it begins with the angel Gabriel speaking to a teenager named Mary. This is going to be our main text, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that's her cousin, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Now, in Jesus' day, they read from of uh, their Bible, which would have been the Septuagint. It was a Greek version of the Old Testament. And if you compare the Greek version of the Old Testament that Jesus used, and you compare it with the New Testament, which is written in Greek, the word in that last phrase, the wording is identical to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Why is that significant? Because Luke is trying to give us a hyperlink, okay? If you guys are a little technical, you know what a hyperlink is. He's trying to show us from the New Testament, the promise that this points back to in the Old Testament in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Now, the other significant thing is that his name is Jesus. Anybody know what that is in, Jew in, in Hebrew? Yeshua. Okay, and within Yeshua, we have the word yasa, and yasa means saves. Okay, so we have a lot of significance here. Verse 32 he will be great, the angel's still speaking, he will be great and be called the son of the most high. Now he's referring to his divinity. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now he's referring to his messiahship. A lot of theology here. Verse 33, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So from this birth announcement, this is not just a proclamation of, of just any baby, right? This is the baby who would be savior, God, and king. So much rich, dense theology just in that phrase there. God saw our lost and dark world, and love compelled him to act in an extraordinary way. Heaven is going to invade earth as a baby named Jesus, and he will be a king that will bring the rule of heaven to earth. And that brings me to our big idea. If you're taking notes today in your worship guide, here it is. When God moves, it's always a matter of love. When God moves, it's always a matter of love, love that will care for us, but also take us up into his saving purposes. Simply, Christmas is love in action. Now, I think we sometimes fail to recognize love because we think of love as just an emotion, all right? We think of love as just that warm, fuzzy, wuzzy feeling, right, that you have for your mom or your boyfriend or your atheist cats, whichever the case may be. But the fulfillment, I know I'm not making a lot of fans here with this cat jokes. Anyways, the fulfillment of the promise of love in the Christmas story comes through action. This won't be a typical message on love. In fact, I see three surprising aspects of love in Mary's story. Here's the first one for your notes if you're taking notes. Love can be a disruption. Love can be a disruption. 
Let me unpack that. We don't think of love like that, but certainly this act of love was a major disruption in Mary's life. In fact, I would argue that when God shows up, our lives are disrupted. That's what happened with Mary. She's doing her thing, and an archangel shows up and says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Mary's life was taking a turn that she couldn't have expected, right? As far as she knows, she's about to marry this nice Jewish boy named Joseph, right? They're going to settle down. He's setting up his carpenter shop. She's learning how to make matzo ball soup. I don't know, right? But suddenly, all of a sudden, she's told, she's chosen to give birth to the Savior of the world. Think about that. That's a disruption. For Joseph, think about him, your fiancé suddenly becomes pregnant, and it's not your baby. Okay? That's a disruption. All right? What is he supposed to say? What's he supposed to say to his parents, his friends, his rabbi? Trust me, we maintained a six-inch rule. I don't know what happened. For the political power of the day, which would have been King Herod, this was a disruption, right? Because this baby going to come is going to be the son of God. He will take on the throne of his father, David, and his kingdom will have no end. Simply, Herod was jelly, okay? And we see that in the story. Even on a human level, love can be a disruption, okay? If you don't believe me, think about the love of a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend. Can that be disruptive? Can I get a witness? Okay, yeah, especially the parents of teens who have these boyfriends and girlfriends, okay, texting 15 times a day or maybe 15 times an hour, stalking them on social media. Another kind of love that could be disruptive is a love for a Shiba Inu rescue. Okay, particularly if it's ours, because he is truly the undog. Okay, he doesn't listen. When you talk to him, he doesn't, he, we take him for a walk and he stops in the middle of the road two minutes in. Just stops, just sits down, I'm done. In fact, they're so famous for doing this, they actually make a Christmas ornament, okay? Okay, this one's hanging on our tree. This is not custom made, okay? This is, this is real with these dogs. You see, a disruption is anything that stops something from operating in a normal way, okay? And heaven invading earth is not normal, what could be less status quo than Emmanuel, God with us? So we have two choices when disruptions come. We can either avoid it or we can embrace it. You see, I believe that when God is trying to birth something new in us, we often try to avoid it, right? We avoid it because it could be confusing or it could be difficult or it could be scary or uncomfortable, but rather than avoid it, we need to embrace what is God up to in and through this disruption, a couple of years ago, I was going through a very uh, spiritually dry season. I was so emotionally spent that it impacted me spiritually. I, I read my Bible and I prayed every day, but I felt disconnected, empty. So I'm reading this book about Sabbath. And Sabbath in Hebrew is Shabbat, and it means to cease. And that's why we go to church, by the way, on the first day of the week, because we're supposed to cease from our normal activities and put God first in our week, Right? But for me, I felt led that I needed to add an additional Sabbath of 15 to 20 minutes a day just being silent before the Lord. And I'm not talking about prayer or Bible study because I, I did that. That was, that was separate, different time. I'm talking about sitting there and silence. And that's really hard for me, if you've ever noticed, okay? Because either my mouth is going or my mind is going. Am I the only one? Y'all got your, your, your halos on today, right? No, okay. Some of you too, right? So what did I do? I went into my backyard because I wanted to be a little closer to creation. And I sat there silently. I could hear the birds. I could hear the wind rustling. And I could hear my own breath. I'm kind of ADD, so I'd also, you know, literally go squirrel, right? So, so to try to keep myself from getting too distracted, I would meditate on a tiny piece of scripture. For example, Psalm 16. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. Or Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. It was hard and it was awkward, but after a few weeks, it got easier and I began to look forward to it. And the best way I could describe it is this. It was like I was stopping so that I could breathe the air of eternity. It was profound. And then one day, 
I felt the spirit of God wash over me like a flood and I was overwhelmed by God's grace, love, and mercy. Didn't happen all the time, but in that moment, I felt, had this profound glimpse of how wide and how deep the love of God is. And God started showing me things that I needed to change, and he showed me people that I needed to forgive. Somehow, it was both uncomfortable and comforting at the same moment. You see, God left, he met me where I was, and he was birthing something new in my life through a disruption. How about you? Maybe you're listening today and you're wrestling with some kind of disruption in your life. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're going through a spiritually dry period. Or perhaps there's a problem that you're facing or a relationship issue or, or a sin that has taken hold of you. Or maybe there's something different. Maybe it's something positive, like you, you have this exciting opportunity that's got you scared. Here's the thing. Don't avoid because God may be using that disruption to do something new in you. Amen. That's what God was doing with Mary. And look at how she responds. The first way she responds is in verse 34. Come up on your screen. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? So Mary's first response to the question brings me to the second surprising aspect of love for today, which is this. Love can cause you to question. So love can cause you to question. This is uh, one of the most natural things in the world. When God is on the move in the world and in your world, like Mary, it can prompt us to question things. Now, kind of a side note here, but I want to point out that skeptics say that the people of the Bible, like Mary, they believed in miracles like the virgin birth and stuff like that because it was, you know, they're pre-scientific. They lived in a pre-scientific era. So they had to use miracles to just explain everything away. I hate to burst their bubble. Okay, Mary may not have known about things like X and Y chromosomes, but you know what? Mary knew how babies were made, okay? And it wasn't from swallowing a watermelon seed. <laughs> Which is why she asked the very logical question, how will this be since I'm a virgin, Right? You see, if anyone claimed to be pregnant by any other means, guess what? They'd be made fun of in the ancient world just like they would today. In fact, Mary would have faced more criticism and trials for appearing to break a moral principle that is largely ignored today. So it was even worse for her. But you see, when God moves, questions are normal, but there are two kinds of questions and in fact, I believe that God uh, orchestrated Luke chapter 1 so that we see two stories here. We see the story of last week, which was Zechariah the priest, who also had an angel come, who also had a question. Right in the middle, we have Mary coming with this angel too. And I think it's intentional. Luke is trying to show us a contrast of these two people. There's a clear contrast between the skeptical priest, Zechariah, and Mary. You see, when Gabriel comes to Zechariah with the birth announcement, so excited about John the Baptist, Zechariah asks this in verse 18. It says this, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. In contrast, Mary asks, how will this be? Do you see the difference? She asks, how will this be? He asks, how can I be sure? You see, Zechariah is looking for proof. Mary's looking for information. And I believe it's not information just to satisfy her curiosity. I believe it's information to ensure her alignment with God, her father. For all she knew, maybe the angel would have needed her to go to the temple and make a sacrifice. That would have been a natural thing to have to maybe be able to do. Or maybe she would have to go down to the River Jordan and wash. So she's asking, right? Ladies, you, by the way, you're going to want to stay away from water like that. It's water that can make you pregnant. That's, that's not a real thing, by the way, if there's anybody younger in here. No, what does the angel say in verse 35? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The, uh, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative is going to have a child in her old age. That's John the Baptist in verse 37. For no word from God will ever fail. Some people teach that Mary doubted. I've heard it pastors, preachers, that, he, that she's just like Zechariah. I, t I tell them, you know what? Read the story. Read the whole story. Because after Zechariah's skepticism, the angel scolded him, right? And actually forbid him to speak 
until the baby came. In contrast, the angel does not chastise Mary. Instead, he answers her question because I believe he knows the heart behind her question. You see, the key is your posture. Mary's question was from a posture of faith. And that's how we are to approach God. In 20 plus years of ministries, I've seen over and over that people use disruptions and unanswered questions as excuses to not move forward in what God has for them. Because we become experts in knowing what God cannot do in our life. People think, oh, God can't use me. I've made too many mistakes or or there's no way that God can save my marriage. It's just too far gone or, or I'll never see that relationship with my son or my daughter restored. There's just too much damage or I'll never be able to stay clean and sober. The temptation is too strong. These are all excuses for why we can't experience God birthing something new in us. You see, if you want to experience the promise of love, you need to move beyond human perspective. You need to remember that what is impossible with man is possible with God. Our excuses make sense if it depends on us. But through God's love expressed in the miraculous birth of Jesus, anything is possible. His birth changed the world 2,000 years ago, and guess what? His birth is still changing lives today. Why? Because the same spirit of God that came upon Mary can come upon you and I today. It's not about your ability, your effort, your qualifications, your gender, your track record, your status. It's about believing that God is able to do what he has promised to do despite your questions. In the end, I believe Mary still had questions. I can't believe that the explanation that she would be pregnant by the Holy Spirit wouldn't have been a head scratcher, right? In fact, after the narrative, Luke tells us, says this about Mary. He says, Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them, meaning she had questions in her heart. So she still had questions, but look at how she ultimately responds. Verse 38, this is the most beautiful part of the story. She says, I am the Lord's servant, handmaiden in the King James. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. And I love the way the New King James translation actually says it. It says, as Mary says, let it be to me according to your word. And that really gives us our our third surprising aspect of love. Because here's the thing, a faith-filled question was followed by a faith-filled response. And here we are, number three. Love is demonstrated by submission. Love is demonstrated by submission. You see, God had created a major disruption in her life, and she is to lay aside, and she does. She lays aside her plans, her questions, and she says to God, let it be to me according to your word. Have you been waiting and waiting and waiting for something from God? And you don't know why it hasn't happened. Maybe you haven't submitted to him. Or maybe there's something specific in your life that you've not submitted to him. Because I believe that when we submit to God, then his promises can be fulfilled in and through us. That's the secret. But I think we struggle, we even struggle to connect this idea of love and submission, right? That seems like a cognitive disconnect to us, okay? That's not politically correct. That's not popular. It's kind of a bad word in our culture. And I get it. I get it because of fallen uh, humanity, we are prone to be selfish, opportunistic, and even abusive to one another. So we are never called, we're not called to submit to abuse, but to love. The people of God are to operate with love as our supreme ethic. To love is to do what is best for another, even if it's not best for you in that moment. And you see, if someone treats you that way, it's a whole lot easier to submit. In uh, in the context of the Christian household, the Apostle Paul says this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then in the context of the church, the Apostle Peter says this, All of you be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility. So see, love is demonstrated through mutual submission. So think about this. We have Mary. Because of love, Mary submits to God. 
Because of love, believers submit to one another. But here's the thing. The ultimate demonstration of love through submission was Jesus himself, right? Jesus demonstrated love not only by willingly leaving the glories of heaven to be born in a dirty stable, but his ultimate expression of love was through the submission to the cross to save us from our sins and reconcile us to God. You see, the greatest gift wasn't wrapped in a beautiful package and set under a tree. The greatest gift came wrapped in the tender flesh of a baby and was laid in the rugged wood of a manger. And then our perfect gift would later be rewrapped in the scars of our sins and nailed to the rugged wood of a cross, all because of love. So what would that look like? What would that look like if that was our new normal, if submission was our posture that we committed to this Christmas season, if we would love that way? How would our lives be different, and how might God use you to birth something new in someone else's life? Because here's the thing, I believe that Jesus' birth was not intended just to change Mary's life, right? God's loving action plan was to restore mankind to himself and to bring him in, bring them into his kingdom, a kingdom with a mission to heal the broken, to rescue the lost, a, a kingdom where love is the new normal. And that brings me to our call to action for, day, for today. Like Mary, allow God to bring something new into the world through your submission to him. Like Mary, allow God to bring something new into the world through your submission to him. You can start by embracing the disruption, whatever that is, just whatever just popped into your head right? It could be a relational disruption. It could be a need that you can't get off your mind. It could be some kind of situation that has more questions than answers. Listen, don't avoid it. Embrace it and ask God, what are you doing? What are you doing through this? And God, what do you want me to do? Because I believe that the new work that God might do in you could be good news for somebody else because that's love in action. I've already seen it this Christmas season with the incredible generosity of the people of Lifeway who stepped up to adopt every family in need on our Christmas list. Within hours, we texted the church, within hours, every single family was adopted. Let's give God a hand. That's love in action. And we, of course, have more opportunities to make a difference in someone's life through our annual Christmas homeless outreach. This is what happens when we believe the good news of Jesus' birth is more than a historical fact, but a promise that affects our present. Our lives are changed, and in doing so, we can have an eternal impact on the lives of those around us. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, the whole meaning of Christmas can be explained in one word, love. You sent your gift of pure love to us that first Christmas. Love descended from heaven to be born of a virgin. Jesus, you are the King of Kings, yet you have come as you came as an innocent baby, helpless, but with the purpose to walk on this earth in complete love, and then to sacrifice your life as an atonement for our sins, the sins of your children. You are Emmanuel, God with us, love in the form of a man. So with that, God, we ask that you help us to love like you do. Help us to embrace the disruptions in front of us so that you can birth something new in us and that we may become, through that process, conduits of your love to a world that is lost and broken in your name. And as we stay in this moment of prayer, I just want to speak to those who maybe you feel far from God today. You could be in the sanctuary or maybe you're joining us online, but you know that you are not right with him. That's why Jesus came. The Bible says there's no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus willingly gave the gift of his life because of his love. He lived the perfect life that you and I could not and become the perfect sacrifice so that you and I can be forgiven. That is real love. And then he rose up on the third day so that whosoever calls on his name will be saved. If that's you, 
if you're ready, if you, if you need his forgiveness today, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, I invite you to pray this prayer with me now. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. I turn from them and I turn to follow you. Jesus, thank you for being my savior. I cannot save myself. So today I receive your gift of love. I give you leadership in my life as my Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, come and fill me to overflowing so you can empower me to live for you and to lead others to you. Thank you, O oh God, for new life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.